Secret alien or Nazi UFO bases in Antarctica. It's an intriguing idea and popular with many ufologists. Now, whilst admitting that reality is often much stranger than fiction, which is this, reality or fiction? As always, let's take a look at the evidence. The notion that Nazi Germany had a secret UFO base in Antarctica is one of the most famous ideas associated with the end of the Second World War. Specifically, that a number of secret factions of Nazis escaped and set up a secret underground base to aid in the development of their top-secret flying saucer program. Such stories have been circulating for decades, adding uniquely to popular theories about alien visitors that remain a hallmark of modern UFO lore. This idea has had renewed attention during the past few years, thanks to widespread attention given to a 2006 discovery by Ohio State University scientists who found a gravitational anomaly located below Wilkesland, Antarctica. This has been interpreted by some as being the long sought after secret Nazi UFO base. However, it has turned out to be simply an impact crater with a typical mass concentration at its center. It should be noted, firstly, that there is some legitimacy to the idea of a Nazi presence in Antarctica during the years leading up to World War II. In fact, the icy continent's strategic importance prompted an expedition by Germany between 1938 and 1939. This remains a significant contributing factor in the beliefs that the Nazis may have tried to establish a permanent stronghold at the South Pole. It is also well known that a variety of advanced aircraft had been designed by the Germans towards the end of the war, including suggestions that some of these resembled flying saucers. Though in fairness, no verifiable reports have been found that would indicate the veracity of the claims about Nazi flying saucers. In large part, the crux of the entire Nazi UFO affair has long remained centered around a device known as the Glocke, or the Bell. This was a conjectured Nazi weapons project, rumored to have been anything from some kind of experimental anti-gravity device to a special anti-aircraft weapon. Unfortunately, there's a lack of good source material about de Glocke that can help support the case that such a device ever existed. So what, apart from the expeditions carried out by Germany during the 1930s, might serve as the genesis of these legends about a Nazi UFO base in the southernmost polar regions. This notion actually has less to do with anything the Nazis did and instead appears to stem from a series of seemingly cryptic comments made by Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd during an interview with international news service correspondent Lee Van Atta. It's important to interject at this point that Byrd was a highly respected American adventurer and hero known for his pragmatic and down-to-earth views and his proven extreme courage in the face of adversity. The interview, which took place on board the USS Mount Olympus in 1947, appeared in the Wednesday, March the 5th, 1947 edition of a Chilean newspaper, El Mercurio. Admiral Byrd declared that it was imperative for the United States to initiate immediate defense measures against hostile regions, potentially using Antarctica as their base. He further stated that he didn't want to frighten anyone unduly, but that it was a bitter reality, that in the case of a new conflict, the United States could be attacked by, quote, flying objects which could fly from pole to pole at incredible speeds. As one can see, such wording easily lends itself to the idea of a connection between the Nazi UFO myth and something going on at the South Pole. What kind of perceived threat prompted Byrd to make such claims during the interview? Had some kind of danger actually existed in the southernmost extremities of Antarctica just after World War II? And if so, what was the nature of this threat? And could it have been associated with the technological carryovers from Nazi Germany, as some UFO researchers have already speculated over the years? Byrd had been tasked with leading the ill-fated Operation High Jump, which occurred between late 1946 and early 1947 and involved an extremely heavy military presence. 
Hence, some in UFO circles have gone so far as to suggest that Byrd's Operation High Jump represented a secret battle between US forces and a group of Antarctic residents with advanced Nazi UFO technologies. After all, what else might have sent Byrd and his scores of ships and aircraft packing so quickly? terminated six months earlier than expected after embarking upon this extensive and extremely well-funded military expedition. The theory about Nazi UFOs would also seem to explain Byrd's cryptic warning. However, on the contrary, it seems that what Byrd was actually discussing was the threat of an enemy nation getting to Antarctica and establishing military bases there before America. In fact, although details about it remained undisclosed for many years, the establishment of strategic bases had been precisely what the American presence during Operation High Jump had aimed to do. And, as regards the brevity of the expedition, rather than bumping into secret Nazi bases and their armaments, Byrd and his company encountered a relentless and unconquerable enemy, Mother Nature. The brutal conditions during that winter had been creating huge problems. In one dramatic instance in January 1947, a sudden downwind managed to sweep a helicopter mid-takeoff directly into the ocean, leaving a narrow window of opportunity for the pilot to escape the icy waters and be rescued. There were plenty of other situations, however, where the servicemen involved weren't as lucky. Complications resulting from extreme weather conditions led to the loss of several lives during the short period that Operation High Jump was underway. Operation High Jump was terminated the following February, solely because of the worsening weather. Returning again to Byrd's cryptic statements given to El Mercurio, there was no need for an enemy aircraft, standard or exotic, to be present at the time of Operation High Jump to validate Byrd's commentary. Because by the end of World War II, experimental jet engines were already in development, and within a few short years, planes that incorporated such technology would eventually revolutionize both military and commercial aircraft. Admiral Byrd would certainly have known about this and spoke of the expectation that any military with a permanent presence in the South Pole might be able to use this strategic location to launch these aircraft that could reach any place on Earth within just a few short hours. No wonder he was concerned. There is another factor worthy of consideration here. Had Byrd's statements about lightning-fast flying objects been somewhat exaggerated too? Antarctic explorer Paul Sippel noted of the famous El Mercurio interview that the reporters aboard the USS Mount Olympus had somewhat overblown claims from Byrd's earlier expeditions in the region relating to the so-called Bunga's Oasis a lake found to have uniquely warm temperatures, about 30 degrees centigrade or 90 degrees Fahrenheit, containing a variety of algae. Bird later described the location as, a land of blue and green lakes and brown hills in an otherwise limitless expanse of ice, and that his crew had seemed to have dropped out of the 20th century into an ancient landscape where land was just starting to emerge from one of the great ice ages. Bird would later call the discovery by far the most important of the expedition so far as the public interest was concerned. No doubt this led to speculation. Paul Sippel went on to say, the 11 press representatives aboard the USS Mount Olympus had fired off dispatches to the outside world describing the oasis as a Shangri-La implying that it was warmed by a mysterious source of heat that might be supporting vegetation. Bird is claimed to have written in his so-called secret diary, Beyond the mountain range is a valley with a small river. Something is definitely wrong and abnormal here. We should be over ice and snow. Our navigation instruments are still spinning. The gyroscope is oscillating back and forth. Bird continues, saying that he can see animals in the valley, among them, a living specimen of a woolly mammoth. This, no doubt, helped fuel other claims associated with Byrd's expeditions, namely that they had discovered a habitable region at the South Pole, wherein a cavernous entry point into the Earth had led them to meet residents who existed below ground, the so-called hollow Earth dwellers, and took him to meet the Master, 
who said to Bird, we shall not long delay your mission and you will be safely escorted back to the surface. But now, Admiral, I shall tell you why you have been summoned here. Our interest rightly begins just after your race exploded the first atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. It was at that alarming time that we sent our flying machines, the Flugel Rats, to your surface world to investigate. We have never interfered before in your race's wars and barbarity, but now we must for your tampering with a certain power that is not for mankind, namely, that of atomic energy. A wonderful story, but unfortunately, the secret diary has been definitively shown to be a fake. Taken into context, the embellishment of such details by the press could easily have served as the root of claims about not only a prehistoric oasis at the South Pole, but also the flying craft, and eventually, a secret Nazi base. Again, it seems likely that Bird had been making a general statement about the potential uses of enemy aircraft during the coming decades, in the sense that a hostile nation, should they ever establish a base at one of the poles, might use the area as a centralized point for launching attacks against the US mainland. Indeed, Bird had previously suggested that the US might wish to establish such a base at the North Pole. Hence, it seems clear that he viewed the polar extremities as militaristically advantageous locations. Finally, Bird's phrase, in the case of a new conflict, seems to further indicate that his statements dealt not with any existing menace, but instead with the potential for a future threat by an enemy nation. With World War II still fresh in people's minds, many at the time shared concerns such as these. All speculation aside, what we are left with is very little ground for believing that Operation High Jump ended prematurely due to the presence of hidden subterranean races, attacks by woolly mammoths, or even Nazi flying saucers. Few would argue, however, that the various grains of truth pertaining to Bird's historic operations have seeded themselves in the fertile grounds of myth and speculation taking on a new and fascinating life of their own throughout the past several decades. One of the most significant researchers in this area is Micah Hanks, the author of Magic, Mysticism and the Molecule. In his book, he presents his investigative analysis of ancient magical practices, mystical states and out-of-body encounters through altered states of consciousness. Micah also explores stories of mythical animals and lands and critically for our consideration of Operation High Jump, secret advanced technology. Micah is fascinated that there continues to be growing interest in Antarctica and the talk of secret meetings being held there by US presidents, astronauts and scientists. One of the more recent discussions circulates around the discovery of an ancient civilization buried beneath the ice, a civilization that had a complex society. There have even been claims of frozen pyramids photographs of which were published on the internet a few years ago. Dr. Mitch Darcy, a geologist at the German Research Center for Geosciences in Potsdam said, the pyramid shaped structures are located in the Ellsworth Mountains, which is a range more than 400 kilometers long. So it's no surprise that there are rocky peaks cropping out above the ice. The peaks are clearly composed of rock and it's just a coincidence that one particular peak has a pyramid like shape. By definition, it is a nun attack, which is simply a peak of rock sticking out above a glacier or ice sheet. This one has the shape of a pyramid, but it doesn't make it a human construction. Pyramid-shaped peaks are very common. The Matterhorn in the Alps and Mount Bullanstindrath in Iceland are notable examples. Though there are many hard facts here, they do not deter the hardline theorists. They continue to believe Antarctica is the home of a number of secret bases, when in reality, there's no advantage in having a secret base in Antarctica. Because if there were, the world's governments would already have had a very public fight over it. And there is no evidence of that at all. Seemingly, all the South Pole is rich in is natural diversity and scientific opportunities. And long may it stay that way.
Ever since our ancestors gazed up at the night sky and began telling stories about what they observed, the planet Mars has held a particular allure for the human race. Easily visible with the naked eye, with an intriguing reddish hue, the celestial body has long been at the center of ancient myths, modern conspiracy theories, and wild scientific speculation about possible Martian civilizations. It's hard to fathom the number of programs the CIA has or is currently funding and researching. The organization has become known to explore many things, ranging from the sinister to the strange, but often it's the strange ones, notably those that become declassified, because the general populace simply find them too bizarre to be actually be true. When certain programs come to light, it always begs to, to ask that question, what else are they doing that they aren't telling us about? Declassified top secret remote viewing CIA documents have revealed the discovery of an ancient civilization that was once inhabiting the red planet. Prior to the invention of telescopes sufficient to observe the planet for what it was, Mars was associated with gods of various sorts and was an important element in many ancient pantheons. The name of Mars, of course, comes from the ancient Romans, who identified the planet, which they simply regarded as a bright star, with their god of war and agriculture. Likewise, the Greeks, who also called the planet Piraeus, meaning fiery, associated Mars with their own god of war, Ares. In the Hindu tradition, the planet Mars was also linked to warfare, as it stood as a symbol for the war god Mangula, who was born from the sweat or blood of Shiva, and is sometimes called Lohit, meaning made of iron. The ancient Egyptians termed the planet Horus of the Horizon or Horus the Red, equating it with one of their most significant deities. And in the East, ancient Chinese, Japanese and Korean tradition dubbed the Red Planet Firestar. In ancient Mesopotamia, and specifically the late Babylonian pantheon, Mars is the embodiment of Nergal, a god of war, but also one of plague, disease and death who would later go on to become the ruler of the underworld and bore other names including the Burner or the Furious One and the Raging King. Observations of the Red Planet became even more advanced over the ensuing centuries and the fascination with Mars only increased as more accurate information came to light. Ptolemy laid out a workable model of the planet's orbit in the second century and by the 17th the work of Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler were able to reasonably approximate the distance between Earth and Mars, and Kepler later refined earlier estimations of the planet's orbit. Galileo Galilei was the first person to actually observe Mars through a telescope, and Dutch astronomer Christian Huygens is credited with drawing the first map of the planet that featured elements of the Martian terrain, including the volcanic plain known as Certis Major. By the time the 19th century rolled around, Telescope technology had improved to such a degree that astronomers could begin to make out distinct characteristics of the planet's landscape. For in the fall of 1877, during a perihelic opposition of Mars, in which it was relatively close to the Earth, Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli observed the planet through a telescope and was able to draw a fairly detailed map of a portion of Mars's topography, which included what he believed were perhaps seas, continents and vegetation. Significantly on this particular map, Schiaparelli also indicated several long straight lines crisscrossing the planet's surface that he termed canali, which subsequently became translated into English as canals, though it is more accurately translated as channels or even grooves or gullies. Although Schiaparelli did not explicitly make the claim that the canals were artificial constructions rather than natural features, he did note in his book Life on Mars that since there appeared to be so little water on the surface of Mars, the channels might have been the main mechanism by which the water, and with it organic life, can spread on the dry surface of the planet. The perception of canals on Mars, however, spurred something of a craze, both in the scientific community as well as in the public sphere. 
for speculating whether the planet was, or long ago had been, the home to an advanced alien civilization capable of enormous planet-spanning engineering projects undertaken to irrigate the arid surface. Perhaps the most impassioned of these scientists arguing for the advanced life on Mars hypothesis was Percival Lowell, an American businessman, author, and astronomer who made a 15-year study of Mars and published three books on the subject. Lowell's drawings of the Martian surface were intensely detailed, and he even named many of the canals and speculated that a technologically advanced race had constructed the canals as a way to distribute water from Mars's polar ice caps to the rest of the planet. Lowell's observations were supported by a few other astronomers, such as Louis Tholon and Henry Joseph Perrotin, and in 1892, Camille Flammarion wrote a book in which he advocated for Lowell's assertion that the canals had been built by an intelligent civilization who were attempting to irrigate the planet. Flammarion, in fact, hypothesized that the Martians were more advanced than humans. While the idea that Mars harbored intelligent life wasn't completely preposterous at the time, the planet is a similar size and axial tilt to Earth and has somewhat Earth-like seasons. Most other astronomers, even in the 19th century, doubted very highly that the canals were even there, much less that they were evidence of an advanced race of beings. English astronomer William Denning, for example, stated in 1886 that his observations demonstrated that the canals were not straight, unbroken features, but rather irregular and likely natural formations. In like fashion, in 1895, a summary by another English astronomer, Edward Maunder, theorized that the canals were actually not lines at all, but rather small craters and discolorations that only appeared linked together because of the relatively poor optics of the telescopes of the era. To debate over the supposed canals raged well into the 20th century, with even such luminaries as Nikola Tesla speculating that he may have received radio communications from aliens, possibly Martians, at his lab in Colorado Springs. Indeed, the so-called Mars fever that sprung up in the wake of Schiaparelli's and Lowell's observations served as a rich vein to mine for science fiction writers, who spent the next half century spinning marvelous tales of Martian exploration, innovation, and invasion. Perhaps the best well-known and most influential of all fictional takes on an advanced Martian race was H.G. Wells's The War of the Worlds, published in 1898 at the height of the Mars mania, and positing a scenario whereby a hostile Martian force invades Earth in order to harvest resources that have been dwindling on Mars. The fact that a 1938 reenactment of the story, famously performed by Orson Welles on an episode of the American radio series Mercury Theatre on the Air, had such a dramatic impact on the listening public it suggests just how plausible the possibility of a Martian invasion still seemed at the time. Later writers, who were inspired by Lowell's descriptions of Martian society and technological prowess, included Edgar Rice Burroughs, who in 1911 began writing a series named John Carter, who travels to Mars and becomes involved in a conflict between two warring Martian clans. These stories would eventually be codified into a novel Under the Moons of Mars, later retitled The Princess of Mars, which served as the first of Burroughs' ten-book Barsoom series. Robert Heinlein and C.S. Lewis would also pen influential works based on the concept, as would Ray Bradbury, who in 1950 published The Martian Chronicles, a series of loosely connected stories in which humans attempting to colonize Mars in the wake of an atomic catastrophe on Earth clash with the native Martian population. The romantic idea of Mars as a somewhat alternate Earth, whose inhabitants would either be our saviors or our destroyers, persisted into the 1960s, when scientific reality would definitely hammer the nail into the coffin of Lowell's canals and their indication of intelligent life on Mars. Beginning with the Mariner and Voyager missions in the 1960s and 1970s, the last vestiges of hope for intelligent Martian life rather quickly lost their hold on the public imagination. Much better telescopes and improved photography of the Martian terrain conclusively showed that not only were there no canals or other artificially constructed features, but that nearly the entire surface of the planet resembled nothing so much as a vast desert, 
pockmarked with gigantic craters and blasted rock formations. Further, more accurate measurements of Mars' climate and habitability factors demonstrated temperatures hovering around minus 100 degrees Celsius, an extremely low atmospheric pressure, not to mention devastating dust storms and a complete lack of surface water or vegetation. Life on Mars, it seemed, or at least life approximating that on Earth, was no longer a viable prospect. That isn't to say, however, that there haven't been a few holdouts in the whole life on Mars conversation. Following the Viking 1 and Viking 2 orbiter missions launched by NASA in 1975, two strange anomalous photos of a region of the planet known as Cydonia appeared to depict a massive monument that resembled a humanoid face. The photos were independently singled out by two computer engineers at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and therefore seeped into the popular consciousness. Author Richard C. Hoagland was one of the main proponents of the conjecture that the so-called face on Mars was evidence of an advanced civilization on the Red Planet. Hoagland, in his 1987 book The Monuments of Mars, A City on the Edge of Forever, claimed that a race of technologically sophisticated Martians had built an entire city on the plain of Cydonia, which featured not just the iconic face, but also pyramids and other geometric structures. He further asserted in this work and later ones that NASA was involved in a convoluted cover-up to suppress evidence of intelligent life not only on Mars but also on Venus and the Moon. Shortly after NASA was founded, it sought out expert opinions on the international, legal and economy ramifications of the US space program. The Brookings Institute responded with a 1960 report that included thoughts on the dealing with extraterrestrials, proposed studies of the implications of peaceful space activities for non-human affairs. It touched upon a wide range of policies which had certain issues which included communications, uh, weather predicting systems and space industries. Amongst the 186 pages of recommendations were two pages that addressed the question of what could happen if we established contact with an extraterrestrial civilization. The report recommended continued studies to determine emotional and intellectual understanding and attributes regarding the possibilities of intelligent extraterrestrial life. Also studies to understand the behavior of people and their leaders when confronted with dramatic and unfamiliar events or social pressures. The latter aim to determine how such information might be shared or withheld from the public. This may be significant reasons why we would be told that no unusual anomalies are found on the surface of Mars, including the mysterious face on Mars. Although scientists have completely dismissed the face as nothing but an optical illusion, and indeed higher resolution images of the formation have demonstrated that it is likely nothing more than a natural, mountainous feature with vaguely face-like aspects, other interested parties have taken Hoagland's ideas and run with them. A 2014 image that made the rounds, for instance, shows something which closely resembles a human femur bone, while a 2017 photo generated by the Curiosity rover depicts a suspiciously spherical item, which some observers have speculated may be a cannonball left over from some long-ago Martian battle. And an even earlier photo from 2007 featured a rock formation that eerily approximated a statue of a walking woman or some other kind of hominid. There have been hundreds of photographs taken of Mars that seemingly depict strange artifacts, structures and machinery. Some researchers believe that these represent an ancient Martian civilization that once thrived hundreds of thousands of years ago. If that's true, then what happened? that caused their mass extinction. Some believe it was a catastrophe, some type of huge meteorological event, such as a meteor striking the planet. Others believe it was the byproduct of a huge war that left the planet with no atmosphere and eventually dried out, leaving nothing but dust and sand. 
there are even those that believe we are, are the Martians ourselves. Whatever the cause, it would seem our nearest neighbouring planet may once have been very much like Earth. Certainly, looking at some of these unusual photographs of the Martian surface, there are objects and items scattered around that really do deserve an explanation as to what they are. From these ambiguous images and NASA's repeated explanations of them as natural features, conspiracy theories have continued to ferment around life on the Red Planet. Despite scientists maintaining that even if life does exist on Mars, it is most likely microbial or bacterial and resides well below the arid surface, where small amounts of water may indeed be present. The persistence of the intelligent Martian narrative, then, would seem to prove Carl Sagan's comment when he stated in 1980, Mars has become a kind of mythic arena onto which we have projected our earthly hopes and fears. If planet Mars did have a civilization on it, an ancient civilization, why would we not be told? Why would such a thing like this, of this magnitude, be kept from us? Well, it depends what the implications are. It's not the information, it's the implications of the information which is always critical, always to make sure that it's not impacting society in some negative manner. Are we ready for the truth? Well, I've been asked that question many times. Yes, to the community that I know of, um, but many people out there are probably not. Are we the Martians? You know, it has been specul speculated that we could have come from Mars. We're the aliens, you know. Um, possible, who knows? I mean, many, many thousands, if not millions of years ago, if there was a civilization that flourished on Mars and they had advanced technology, and if they were aware of some catastrophe looming over them, then yes, it would be feasible that they would leave that planet and travel somewhere else. Maybe its nearest neighbor, planet Earth. Who knows? Um, one thing is for sure that us humans are unusual creatures and the evidence against the Darwinian theory that we have derived from apes is getting thinner and thinner by the year. Where did we come from? How did we get here? And have we come from another planet? are just many of the questions we can't answer. We are, and as many researchers have stated, uh, and a, a species with amnesia, we don't know, we haven't got the answers. We can only look out to the stars, to the ancients, to the past, and try and figure out who we were and where we've come from. As time progresses, as technology progresses, and humanity progresses, we are, and will do, leave this planet and we will transition to the stars and we will travel the pl to planets to planets and we will probably learn a lot more about where we may have derived and how we came to be. One thing is for sure, there are thousands, hundreds uh, of thousands of people that believe that we come from the stars and the evidence towards that is being stacked up in photographic information which somehow gets itself out onto the internet, taken by numerous space explorations and NASA, uh, European Space Agency, and of course even China now, are uh, anomalies on film, on photograph. And when you look at them, you can clearly see things that need some form of explanation as to what they are. Are we getting those explained to us? No, we're not. What is it to hide? Where, why are we not being told the truth? I've been impressed by a number of photographs, but the ones that seem to come to mind are the tubes, the photographs on Mars of these strange tubes that seem to be sometimes on the surface of Mars, sometimes beneath the surface of Mars, twisting in unusual shapes, sometimes have unusual light appearance to them as if they're reflective maybe. What are those tubes? Well, they don't seem to be natural. They don't look to be natural. They look man-made. I don't know what they are. Most people that have seen the photographs will probably tell you that they believe it was some type of advanced technology from traversing from one part of the planet to another. 
maybe vehicles, maybe something else. I will continue to think that life will always live, live somehow in, in space. Life has always a way of, of working and, and uh, we need water and, and water is, the, is basically the main ingredient of life. It seems that water might be abundant through not just our solar system but throughout the universe. And if that is the case then what life is out there it could be immense could be plentiful, could be intelligent, and could be sat there thinking this very same thought at this moment in time as to who else is out there. One day, I'm sure we'll find out. The moon, a source of wonder, fascination, and curiosity and mystery since the beginning of humanity. And no matter how much scientific data is collected, the mysteries seem to continue. Whether it is hollow, or just a holographic projection, or an alien spaceship, or colonized by aliens in underground and overground cities, the list goes on. The Moon is a deliberately created scale model of the Sun, and it presently stands at a distance from the Sun and from Earth, which is totally outrageous in terms of mathematical and physical results. In fact, astronomers have been unable to find any other Moon in our solar system that acts in the same way, forever keeping one side for facing away from Earth. It's also seemingly unusual to find anything like that. From a cosmological point of view, the Moon was created as a result of a collision between the Earth and a Mars-sized protoplanet named Theia four and a half billion years ago, when our solar system was just forming. The impact caused some of the Earth's early crust to be ejected, and over time and under the influence of gravitation, it consolidated into a sphere. That's the scientific viewpoint. Now let's investigate the other thoughts. We'll start with the already inhabited theory. On July the 20th, 1953, John O'Neill, the science editor for the New York Tribune, discovered what he thought was a 12 mile long bridge on the surface of the moon. He contacted the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers with this finding. But as soon as he announced his discovery, O'Neill was attacked by skeptical scientists. However, much to their surprise, Famed British astronomer Hugh Percy Wilkins confirmed that he too had seen the mysterious formation and on the BBC in 1953 said, This is a real bridge. Its span is about 20 miles from one side to the other and at least 5,000 feet from the surface beneath. He added, Oh, there's no mistake, it's artificial. However, a year later he changed his mind. Using the 60-inch reflector at Mount Wilson Observatory in Southern California, as opposed to the 4 and 15-inch telescopes he'd previously used, Wilkins found O'Neill's bridge and shadow to be a lunar crater fragment, and significantly, that the shadow was actually facing the sun. Not all photographic anomalies on the moon can be dismissed so easily. There are hundreds of photographs that seemingly depict ancient type structures on the moon, one could not help ask a number of questions. One, what the hell is up there? Two, how old are these structures? And three, who built them? Maybe we can thank the Brookings Institute as to why we don't have these answers. As they suggested in an official report, uh, should we find evidence on the moon of extraterrestrial presence, don't tell the people. The implications of such news could have negative impacts on our society. More controversially, there are those who believe the Moon is a hollow sphere. This is a recent theory, and possibly derives from, or was inspired by, the more ancient theories that the Earth itself is hollow. So let's take a passing look at the hollow Earth theory, and at any similarities suggestive of a common ancestry. The idea that the Earth is hollow has been around for centuries. Indeed, in 1692, the famous astronomer Edmund Halley proposed it from a scientific point of view. In more recent times, hollow Earth theory proposes that there are openings at each pole where you can enter the planet. An inner sun keeps the place warm, and an advanced civilization of humanoids thrives beneath our feet in the kingdom of Agatha. So where's the proof? 
When it comes to Admiral Byrd's statements and diary logs, we have to ask, was he completely mad? <laughs> or was there any elements of his story actually true? You can well imagine his story has certainly lent hand to many conspiracy theories. Even now, in 2019, we have circulating stories from alleged whistleblowers describing secret underground bases in Antarctica that looks to have been created by an advanced race. Some believing that they are actually extraterrestrial in origin. Well, in 1947, Admiral Richard E. Byrd, the famed explorer, allegedly flew into the opening to the inner Earth, situated at either the South or the North Pole, depending upon your source of information. There, he encountered a race of intelligent beings living in gleaming cities, who told him to go back to the surface and warn the human race that we'd better smarten up or we'd destroy the planet. This comes from what is claimed to be the Admiral's secret diary, though the document's authenticity has largely been discredited. Supporters of hollow earth theory believe this claim of fakery is just part of the obfuscation meant to hide the truth from the public. Of course, if they're right and our governments won't admit the earth is hollow, they certainly aren't going to tell us anything of significance or concern about the moon. But where did this hollow moon idea come from anyway? It's really unclear if the moon is in fact hollow or just has vast underground caverns. In either case, it's certainly interesting to learn that what might be below the surface of the moon. In fact, it was science fiction books that developed into a number of movies depicting our moon as a home world for extraterrestrial beings. It was first mooted by H.G. Wells in his wonderful and insightful 1901 book, The First Men in the Moon. To support the theory, one compelling piece of evidence often cited is the experiences of Apollo missions back in the late 60s after placing seismic sensors on the moon. When Apollo 12 deliberately crashed the ascent stage of its lunar module onto the moon's surface, the sensors picked up a ringing sound, like a bell, for an hour afterwards. And each time the action was repeated on subsequent missions, the same happened. Furthermore, the same sound was heard when moonquakes occurred. Now this doesn't happen on the Earth. So why the moon? Unless it's hollow. Though the composition of the Earth and moon are similar, the moon has a much higher proportion of low density crust. Because it is theorized the moon, through its originating impact, is largely made up of ancient Earth crust, not high density core. Therefore, NASA has concluded that the difference in sound between impacts or quakes on the Earth and the Moon is related to their differences in texture, rock type and density. But if it is actually hollow, what's inside the Moon? One suggestion is that aliens are using it as a base. We know that with our current technology, it would take many thousands of years for us to reach the closest star system. In the next century or so, we may be able to whittle it down to a few hundred years. But even traveling at the speed of light, it's a journey of at least four years to the next solar system. We always assume alien civilizations who might visit the Earth have found a way around this distance barrier, either by utilizing theoretical wormholes or some other technological achievement that we can barely imagine. But what if they haven't? What if it still takes hundreds or even thousands of years for them to get here from wherever they come from? If they are visiting the Earth, they may have come here in generational ships. Massive vessels the size of cities or even continents where the aliens would live out their lives during the journey. Maybe the aliens visiting us today are the descendants of those who left their home world long ago. And perhaps using such a ship, an alien civilization has deposited colonies on various star systems to observe primitive life as it develops, uh, which would be us, by the way. I believe there are a number of unusual anomalies throughout our solar system, be it on our moon, on other moons circulating planets, and even the odd asteroid. It does seem to be strange formations, even the odd unusual lights that have been seen. Um, as to having that information, um, uh, and its existence of being ancient sites or not, 
we may never get. We ne may never get that information from authorities like NASA. However, there are independent researchers out there and astronomers which are coming forward and providing bits of information, tantalizing bits of information and images from independent um, labs and telescopes which are pointed to the heavens, which are providing little bits of data out on the internet which people see and say, okay, there's something strange on that or there's something strange there. Pressing this with NASA, they don't tend to communicate very well and say, okay, we can explain this. Most of the time, we, it's unanswered. Um, leaving to the, conspir the conspiritualists to believe what they want. And at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's a toss of a coin. Is it something unusual or is it not? Um, I've seen some of those images, I would say yes, some of them are profoundly unusual. Others, there probably are rational explanations for. After all, there are probable things that are taking place on an environmental level out there in space on these other moons and asteroids that we're currently unaware of. Um, and there's obviously there's a learning curve that's involved. And what better place to hide such a colony than within a hollow moon? Indeed, a few NASA ex-employees claim to have seen satellite photography of such bases on the moon. The big question is, if there is a base on the far side, is it ours? Or does it belong to an alien race? If ours, then why don't we know about it? Is there some credence in the secret space program theory? Or if extraterrestrial, we can only imagine the aliens' irritation when NASA astronauts started ringing their home like a bell and running around on the surface. Perhaps a warning not to return is true, and to avoid hysteria, governments have hidden the truth from the general population. In 2001, Sergeant Carl Wolf gained fame when he came forward with claims that he'd seen photographic evidence of alien structures on the far side of the moon when working at NASA. Any further information that Carl Wolf had was pretty much lost over the years. Um, but unfortunately, he was killed by a tractor when he was struck stra straight on whilst riding his motorcycle. Whatever other information there was, what Carl had, unfortunately, would be lost with him. In the 1960s, NASA compiled a list of strange sightings on the moon as seen by reputable astronomers. The report reveals hundreds of strange objects moving on the surface with odd lights seen in the dark of the moon, and even clouds streaming across its exterior. Are these suggestions of, for example, a mining operation taking place? I don't think Carl Wolf's death was particularly mysterious. I've read the reports, I've seen the newspaper cuttings, um, I know about the incident. It just seems to be one of those unfortunate incidents that took place uh, whilst he was riding his mo motorcycle and collided with a tractor and of course it ended with, with him um, being killed. There are obviously people out there who are into conspiracy theorists which will say yes there's something more to it but I don't see enough evidence for that. For most of our history we had no way of getting there and even now we pretty much leave it alone. Plus one side of the moon is always facing away from the earth who knows what could be going on beyond our prying eyes? On the far side of the moon, you might find very elaborate construction projects. There could even be buildings, highways and spaceships launching and descending. And you would never see it because you only see the side that faces the Earth. Having said that, it would be fair to note that none of the far side probes, satellites or even the recent Chinese Chang'e 4 lander have spotted such things. One of the biggest questions that people ask is, do you think the general public deserve to know the truth? Should there be anomalies on our moon? Well, for years I would say, yes, we need to know the truth, um, that there was an extraterrestrial presence or was an extraterrestrial presence there. I have to say, now, I'm not too sure what those implications might be. It could affect religion, economy, a number of different things. And what's the impact across Earth when, um, when those things are affected. There's a lot of things that are involved in this. Um, as a researcher, I would say, yes, let's have the answers out. Let's let people once and for all digest this possible truth. Um, but the academia side of me would say, you know, it's a little bit risky. Um, who knows? Um, hopefully, we will have the truth delivered in time when the general public, um, which the authorities will feel, are happy 
and ready to accept that information. Another theory is that aliens brought the moon here themselves, propelling it through space. This is a relatively new theory and is based on observations that the moon has been heavily bombarded by meteors and asteroids on just one side. This, it has been suggested, indicates that that side was facing the direction it was traveling when entering into Earth's solar system, having been struck by asteroids and space dust during its journey. The scientific response is that the near side of the moon would, through the gravitational influence of the Earth, have remained softer for longer, and so it was more prone to having large lava flows after large impacts, resulting in a somewhat smoother surface. But why would aliens have brought the moon here? Three possible answers have been suggested. First, it is simply an observation post. Second, it is a message to us. Because perhaps one of the oddest cosmological coincidences is that the moon and the sun, from the perspective of the Earth, appear to be the same size. That's because the moon is one four hundredth the size of the sun, and is exactly one hundredth the distance between the Earth and the Sun. This is what gives us solar eclipses, where we can see this remarkable coincidence for ourselves. It's suggested that the aliens placed it there to stop us overestimating ourselves. They would know that we'd eventually realize that the size equivalence of the Moon and Sun was simply a coincidence too far. It would, in effect, send us the message that you're not alone and you'd better develop some modesty. However, this effect, the apparent equivalent sizes of the moon and sun, is only true at our present time. The moon is actually moving away from the Earth at about one and a half inches per year, about the same speed at which our fingernails grow. Originally, it orbited only 14,000 miles away from the Earth, rather than the 250,000 miles as at present, and the sun-moon size equivalents is just temporary. And the third mooted answer as to why the aliens brought and positioned the moon into Earth orbit is that it's actually the generational ship itself. The spaceship moon theory is a stunning idea put forth by a pair of Soviet scientists back in the 1970s. It says the moon is actually a creation of an alien race who parked it in Earth's orbit thousands of years ago. This idea is mainly supported by the depth of the Moon's impact craters. Even the largest craters are fairly shallow, suggesting that there may be some sort of impenetrable hull beneath the surface Moon rock. And of relevance to all these suggestions, it's interesting to note that some Moon rocks are much older than rocks on the Earth. Scientists say this is because the Earth is still geologically active, and new rocks are being formed even today through tectonic activity. However, proponents of hollow moon theory suggest that this difference in the age of rocks is further proof that the moon was constructed elsewhere and brought here by an alien race. There are a number of researchers that believe our moon has been strategically placed in Earth's orbit. However, the evidence to support this theory is rather thin, but not impossible. What about the moon being a holographic projection? I've seen a number of videos of what is referred to as lunar waves, suggesting that the moon is some type of hologram. To be honest, I'm not convinced. One has to take into consideration the limitations of video cameras, optical illusions, and of course, heat shimmers. In 2013, YouTube user Crow777 started posting videos that claimed to show that the moon was merely a projection. He filmed what he called lunar waves, that look like ripples passing over the moon's surface and says that they are power glitches in the projection system. One problem with this theory is that holography was only developed in the 1940s and the moon has been known about for thousands of years. The rebuttal is the moon didn't even exist until the 20th century and that all the ancient writings have been falsified to lead us from the truth. Although the facts do seem largely to contradict these speculations, there is one question that does need to be answered. Why hasn't anyone been back there in the past 40 years? We continue to study it and we send probes, but nobody has actually set foot on the moon since 1972. Why? 
Some researchers believe that when our astronauts were on the moon, alien races warned them not to return. And it's true that after the enormous successes of the 1960s, it was thought that by now there would be colonies on the moon. So why are we ignoring it? Is it really that boring? Or is there something keeping us from going there? Is it possible that our best researchers and astronomers have been wrong about the moon for all these years, including the astronauts who landed there? Or worse, maybe the governments of the world are hiding secrets about the moon? I haven't particularly worked with whistleblowers myself, personally. Um, it's very vague sometimes of information coming from whistleblowers. It's very difficult to check the credentials, especially when they claim to have been working on special projects that physically may not have a paper trail. How do we know what is the truth here? How do we know we're being told the truth? Though information is very interesting and can lead to some findings, it's always worth following the information that whistleblowers provide. However, I would always say, tread carefully in regards what is fact and what is fiction. So, is it a hollow sphere inhabited by aliens from another solar system and keeping a watchful eye on us? Is it a spaceship, a generational craft that has traveled countless light years to arrive at our doorstep thousands of years ago and has remained there ever since? Is it a warning message? Is it a holographic projection controlled by a cabal of interested governments here on Earth? The answer to all of these is probably not. But the idea is intriguing, and there's always the possibility that the scientists are wrong. The moon remains, as it's always been, a mysterious glowing orb in the night sky. And no doubt there are many mysteries still to be uncovered should humans once again decide to travel there. Are extraterrestrials on the moon? I don't know. There seems to be plenty of UFOs around, which people have filmed, photographed, astronomers, NASA, etc. Um, but is there an extraterrestrial civilization living on the moon currently? I would say the evidence would point to there was once. As to now, I really don't know. And if they are, there don't seem to be certainly in sight, rather on the dark side of the moon, or the far side, as said, or underneath. Um, that's very feasible. However, um, are extraterrestrials there now? I wouldn't like to put money on it and say, yes, they are. Um, but the evidence would point to is definitely those UFOs uh, that have been filmed and photographed during most of NASA's missions, not just near Earth, but also lunar orbital. Is the Earth spherical? Well, no, it's geoid, really, which means Earth form. Because it's not a sphere, and because it's somewhat flattened at the poles, we also have oceans, mountains, plains, and other geographical features that give it a unique shape, which is called a geoid. But it turns out that there is certain data and some stories that give us the idea of a hollow Earth. That is, a land that is like a ball that has air in the middle, that is a shell of hundreds of kilometers thick, but hollow in the center. Here we will tell one of the most amazing stories about the hollow Earth. The hollow Earth was a concept proposing that the planet Earth is entirely hollow or contains a substantial interior space, notably suggested by Edmund Haley in the late 17th century. However, the notion was first disproven in 1740 and again in 1774 by Charles Hutton. But was these conclusions accurate? There are still many who believe the Earth has a vast cavern system below our very feet. On the surface, the Mammoth National Park in central Kentucky encompasses around 80 square miles, but underneath lies a twisted labyrinth of limestone caves, creating a network that earns the title the longest cave system in the world. Richard E. Byrd, pilot of the US Navy, flew over the poles, both the Arctic and the Antarctic, with a small Fokker monoplane, he flew over the Arctic, passing through Greenland, Kings Bay, now Nialesund, and Spitsbergen, Svalbard, reaching the North Pole. As for the South Pole, in 1928 he set up a camp based on the northern tip of Roosevelt Island in the Ross Sea, with laboratories, workshops, warehouses, a radio station, and a hospital. This base was the bird camp and his crew of 42 people for 14 months. Roosevelt Island 
is in the northeastern part of the Ross Ice Shelf. The ice covered island off the coast of Antarctica is around about 90 miles long and 35 miles wide and was discovered in 1934 by Admiral Byrd himself. It was, in fact, a perfect location for all base camps. At last, on November the 29th, 1929, he flew over the South Pole. This expedition and three others in 1934, 1939 and 1955 made Byrd a well-known explorer of Antarctica. But here we're going to focus on something that Byrd never spoke about in public, about what happened to him on one of his trips to the Poles, but we know from third parties that he found the entrance to the interior of the Earth. The entrance to the centre of the Earth sounds almost like a bad 1950s sci-fi movie, but is there in fact any truth to this? Ariana? and Agatha as the legendary kingdoms that is said to be located in the Earth's core. Though many remain skeptical, and rightly so, could Admiral Byrd's dialogues provide a tantalizing truth, so amazing it's difficult to believe. Here we have access to his flight log about what happened on February the 19th, 1947. This would be an unofficial expedition, that's why it wasn't previously named. From his blog, we can read the following. I am not at liberty to disclose the following documentation in this writing. It may never see the light of public scrutiny, but I must do my duty and record here so that everyone can read it someday. We're going to avoid log entries that talk about routine issues and we'll go directly to the substance. So registration begins at 0600 hours, 6 in the morning. 0900 hours, vast ice and snow below, Yellowish coloration of nature is observed and dispersed in a linear pattern. Altering the course to better examine this color pattern below, reddish or purple is also observed. Circulating this area in two full turns, returning to the direction assigned by the compass, checking position again with the base camp and transmitting information about colorations in the ice and the snow below. Oh, nine, ten hours. Both magnetic and gyro compasses beginning to gyrate and wobble. We're unable to hold our heading by instrumentation. Take bearing with sun compass, yet all seems well. The controls are seemingly slow to respond and have sluggish quality, but there's no indication of icing. 0915 hours. In the distance is what appears to be mountains. It's no illusion. There are mountains consisting of a small range that I've never seen before. 0955 hours, altitude change to 2,950 feet, encountering strong turbulence again. 10 hundred hours, we are crossing over a small mountain range and still proceeding northwards as best as can be ascertained. Beyond the mountain range is what appears to be a valley with a small river or stream running through the center portion. There should be no green valley below. Something is definitely wrong and abnormal here we should be over ice and snow. To the port side are great forests growing on the mountain slopes. Our navigation instruments are still spinning. The gyroscope is oscillating back and forth. 10.05 hours. I alter altitude to 1400 feet and execute a sharp left turn to better examine the valley below. It is green with either moss or a type of tight-knit grass. The light here seems different. I cannot see the sun anymore. We make another left turn and we spot what seems to be a large animal of some kind below us. It appears to be an elephant. No, it looks more like a mammoth. This is incredible, yet there it is. Decrease altitude to a thousand feet and take binoculars to better examine the animal. It is confirmed, it is definitely a mammoth-like animal. It's not the first time people have reported strange animals. Occasionally, reports do come in of people sighting dinosaurs and other extinct animals. Unusually, it's locations where humans are pretty scarce. If we take for an example the woolly mammoth, well, they were once thought to be legendary creatures. They weren't even identified as extinct species until around about 1790s, I believe. Could it be that Admiral Byrd witnessed some sort of aberration or experienced something more profound? like a portal or doorway to another reality. Report this to base camp. 10.30 hours, encountering more rolling green hills now. The external temperature indicator reads 74 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Continuing on our heading now. Navigation instruments seem normal now. I'm puzzled over their actions. Attempt to contact base camp. Radio is not functioning. 11.30 hours. Countryside below is more level and normal, if I may use that word. Ahead we spot what seems to be a city. This is impossible. Aircraft seem light and oddly buoyant. The controls refuse to respond. My god, off our port and starboard wings are a strange type of aircraft. They're closing rapidly alongside. They're disc-shaped and have a radiant quality to them. They're close enough now to see the markings on them. It's a type of swastika. This is fantastic. Where are we? What has happened? I tug at the controls again. They will not respond. We're caught in an invisible vice grip of some type. 11.35 hours. Our radio crackles and a voice comes through in English with what perhaps is a slight Nordic or Germanic accent. The message is, Welcome Admiral to our domain. We shall land you in exactly seven minutes. Relax Admiral, you are in good hands. I note the engines of our planes have stopped running, but the aircraft is under some strange control and is now turning itself. The controls are useless. 11.40 hours. Another radio message received. We begin the landing process now, and in moments the plane shudders slightly and begins a descent as though caught in some great unseen elevator. The downward motion is negligible, and we touch down only with a slight jolt. 11.45 hours. I'm making a hasty last entry in the flight log. Several men are approaching on foot towards our aircraft. They are tall with blonde hair. In the distance is a large shimmering city pulsating with rainbow hues of color. I do not know what is going to happen now, but I see no signs of weapons on those approaching. I hear now a voice ordering by name to open the cargo door. I comply. End of log. Some of these cabins can be huge. Of course, we don't believe we've probably discovered all these caverns which might be on planet Earth. We do know that vast systems like this do probably exist throughout the solar system. There's even rumors that there are vast cavern systems or some type of hollow area on our moon. So not only do we discuss the topics of hollow Earth here, we're also discussing the topics of the hollow moon. Yes, it's feasible. Things could, like, could exist like that. And yes, there is probably room for a, a civilization to actually live under the ground. After all, ancient civilizations around planet Earth have lived under the ground in periods of time in our past. And they are visible by cave systems that go deep into the planet uh, and, and would, must have taken hundreds of years to construct. It's amazing what people can actually do. But is there a civilization hidden away in Antarctica? That's the biggest question that we face here. And I don't really know for sure if that could exist or not. If so, then it's something that has really been well kept secret. Maybe that we'll learn more as years pass. Or excavations and exploratory uh, science missions go across Antarctica and we do get that information. One thing is for sure, there are many people that are coming forward uh, today utilizing Google Earth as a piece of software to identify locations of interest across Antarctica. And it is a subject which is very well much in the limelight at the moment, especially regarding whistleblowers which are coming forward and saying that they were part of a military operation and involved with locating underground facilities throughout Antarctica that clearly are not our own. If that is the case, then we have to really start thinking, could there be some truth to these uh, incidents? And was Admiral Byrd's diary logs actually real events that, which unfolded, which he made logs of? It's very difficult to know. But one thing is for sure, there's a huge amount of secrecy surrounding Admiral Byrd's diary logs. Where are they? And what was really written in them? It's really difficult to work out what's true and what's not here, but one thing is for sure, we have a huge mystery on our hand. Then, the Admiral describes from memory the following events because he could not register in his log moment by moment as he did up to this point. What follows is his conversation with whoever captured him. Bird and Howie, his radio operator, get off their plane, escorted by their hosts on a kind of flying platform without wheels and take them to a large room in a building that, according to his words, he'd never seen before in his life. In this room, they're invited to have a drink, a delicious drink, but not recognized by neither. Suddenly, 
A door opens silently and Bird is invited to go and talk with the Great Master. On this door, he could see some inscriptions that he couldn't read. This Great Master is an old man, but with delicate features, and he asked the Admiral not to be afraid that he needed to talk to him. The Master told Bird that he had been allowed access for being a good-hearted man and well-known in the surface world. This surprised the Admiral and the teacher continued speaking. You are in the domain of the Ariani, the inner world of Earth. We shall not long delay your mission, and you will be safely escorted back to the surface and for a distance beyond. But now, Admiral, I shall tell you why you have been summoned here. Our interest rightly begins just after your race exploded the first atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. It was at that alarming time we sent our flying machines, the Flugelrads, to your surface world to investigate what your race had done. That is, of course, past history now, my dear Admiral, but I must continue on. Our emissaries have already delivered messages to the powers of your world, and yet they do not heed. Now you have been chosen to be witness here that our world does exist. You see, our culture and science is many thousands of years beyond your race, Admiral. Your race has now reached the point of no return, for there are those amongst you who would destroy your very world rather than relinquish their power as they know it. Antarctica has been a mysterious place for a long time, with people claiming that they've seen all sorts of strange things from there. It was in the 1970s and to the 1980s, people who reported seeing a very large black hole over Antarctica. There was in, one, in fact one satellite photograph that circulated the internet. However, it turned out that it was actually part of the actual photographic process and the arm of the, of the photographic uh, telescope which caused this round hole to appear in the middle of the Antarctic. Um, that was pretty much realised very quickly. However, it didn't stop people coming forward with conspiracy theories that there was a massive cover-up. There was a huge hole in the Antarctica where objects, flying discs and things would enter in and come out of. And of course, the governments of the world were keeping that very hush-hush. Truth of the matter is, um, there are some strange, unusual holes in, in Antarctica, caverns, systems, caves. Could they be a place where, which are entrances to another world? Who really knows? It seems that Antarctica is well off the map for being a location where you can visit. It seems very difficult to find out any information about Antarctica these days, even though in the 21st century we all have access to computer and software systems which might be able to utilise satellites to find locations. There are still areas completely blacked out. We have to question why is that? In 1945 and afterwards, we tried to contact your race, but our efforts were met with hostility. Our flugelrads were fired upon. Yes, even pursued with malice and animosity by your fighter planes. So now I say to you, my son, there is a great storm gathering in your world, a black fury that will not spend itself for many years. There will be no answer in your arms, there will be no safety in your science. It may rage on until every flower of your culture is trampled and all human things are leveled in vast chaos. Your recent war was only a prelude of what is yet to come for your race. We here see it more clearly with each hour. Do you say I am mistaken? Bird replied that no, he knew that the Earth had passed through a dark age previously. The teacher continued with his monologue about the end of the Earth, environmental pollution and so on which are the factors that will take us to the next dark age, which will come to Earth, and ask Bird to spread his message to future generations. It's not a real surprise to find that people believe in ancient hidden cities around the world. We, we've already discovered ancient cities b before. We still know that there are some ancient cities which haven't been found yet, which we believe exist, such as the lost city of the Amazon. There are many places like this which researchers and scientists still continue to try and find. However, it does prove that, yes, we can hide such a thing like this, in plain sight in some occasions. What happens if something is underground? Well, that's literally not going to be found at all, especially in a region known as Antarctica, where prying eyes don't get a chance to see what's actually there. It is a complete lockdown location, and I think only people go in and out is military and science expeditions. Any of us living an experience like birds would go out into the world and tell our story, 
without thinking that many people would think that we are crazy. Instead, Bird hid the message, keeping it to himself. Why did he do this? Well, simply because when he told the high commanders of the Pentagon, they ordered him to be silent. Even the President of the United States, Harry S. Truman, was duly informed too. The Admiral, being a soldier, kept silent, accepting the orders of silence in the name of humanity. What? Was Admiral Richard Byrd a visitor to the Hollow Earth? Did the Ariani, the inhabitants of the Hollow Earth, allow him entry? Does this mean that the inhabitants of the Hollow Earth can open doors or gateways to their domains? If we have to be partial, there are certain sources that say that his diary does not exist and that it is from the writer F. Amadeo Gianni, published in 1957. His book is called The World Beyond the Poles, where he tells the story of Admiral Byrd and that this story comes to light. There are, in addition to this document, many sources that cite the Hollow Earth, from the city of Erx in Argentina to the cave of Los Tayos in Ecuador. Not only would there be entrances to an underground world, but also a kind of entrance hall to the Hollow Earth itself. In ancient times, the concept of a subterranean land inside the Earth appeared in mythology, folklore and legends. The idea of a subterranean realms became intertwined with the concepts of places and origin of even afterlife, such as the Greek underworld. Even the Tibetan Buddhists believe that there is, in fact, an ancient city called Shambhala, which is located inside the Earth. If we believe in the Admiral's diary, the Ariani have been sending their UFOs called Flugelrads for years. They would bring their message of peace so that we take care of our planet, but then man attacks the UFOs, preventing them from delivering the message. So is there any new evidence to support Admiral Byrd's claims? It's been a long time since Admiral Byrd visited Antarctica, as you can well imagine. Well, there are whistleblowers that have come forward, as I've previously mentioned, who talk about coming across certain facilities that look to be advanced technology, look to be that they may have not been, been created by, by us. If that is the case, then that lends even new theories and new ideas about what is really going on in Antarctica. There is even speculation that numerous officials, presidents and astronomers and scientists had a gathering at Antarctica not too long ago. If that is true, then we have to ask the questions why. Was this some mass discovery that needed their input? It's interesting to note that there seems to be evidence to support that, that these people were around the Antarctica location at that given time. Why astronauts? Why scientists? Why presidents? It would suggest that something of major was discovered in Antarctica. And if that is the case, then could it have been this lost city, the lost city that Admiral Byrd claimed to have witnessed? Recall the case of the Battle of Los Angeles, a UFO of gigantic dimensions on February the 25th, 1942, flew over Los Angeles, generating alarm since the United States had entered World War II less than three months earlier. Was it a Flugelrad sent by the Ariani to try to stop the Second World War and that it wanted to communicate with the high commanders of the United States? If so, obviously the dialogues between the Ariani and the humans ended before we started. Maybe because of this, we can never get in touch with the other inhabitants of our world.